Grace and peace of Dios Les Bendiga Hickam Community Church. Welcome to our online worship service for Sunday, May the 24th, 2020. Thank you for joining us. Well, let's start by wishing these people a happy birthday this week. Audrey Van Rice, Liz Eisenhower, Sophia York, Shirley Conover, Nikki Taylor, and Joanna Gravel. Happy birthday to each of you, and may the Lord bless you this year. Well, once again, we'd like to thank you for your consistent giving. Please remember to do so. You can do it online, by mail, or simply drop it by the office. Well, summer is almost here, and the Women's Summer Program is starting with small discipleship groups that will meet at different times during the week. So ladies, if you're interested in joining one and didn't get an email, there's more information on our website, home, website homepage, or you can talk to Diane Zillow. Well, June is fast approaching, and that means VBS. We are planning on hosting a VBS program. It'll be Monday through Friday, June 8th through the 12th. Now, while we are planning this, be aware that the particulars of how it's run might need to change, but we're pressing ahead. In a worst case scenario, we'll cancel, but Lord willing, we won't have to. Remember, if you have any needs at all, please feel free to contact us at the office. Until we meet again, be sure to be on the lookout for more emails, blogs, and videos from us to come. Thank you for worshiping online with us today. Good morning, Hickman Church, and welcome to today's online service. Today we're going to be reading Psalm 16. This is a wonderful psalm relating how David considered his relationship with God to be the most important dimension in his life. David recognized that every good thing in his life was a blessing and a gift from God. The psalm also powerfully predicts Christ Jesus and his work of redemption on our behalf. Psalm 16, verse 1. Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good besides you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God will be multiplied. I shall not pour out their drink offering of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, in your right hand, there are pleasures forever. Please join me in prayer. Father, this morning, our prayer is that you will make us ambassadors of grace. When we consider our sin against the holy God and how we have been forgiven of all our transgressions, we feel the loving kindness of a God who showers us with his superabounding grace. May your gospel flow through us as we extend grace to others. As your chosen nation, give us hearts to pray for our enemies and love those who do not understand our faith in a God that they cannot see. Father, we thank you knowing it was through your sovereign grace alone that we were convicted of our wretchedness. You chose us and opened the eyes of our heart to understand your kindness that has led us to repentance. It was because you first loved us that we find ourselves with this intense desire 
to grow in our understanding of the word of truth. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the divisions of the soul and the spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of our heart. Father, we know that we are totally consecrated through the work of Christ, but still lack in full obedience. Sanctify us by the influence of the Spirit. Create in us a desire to write your law upon our hearts and help us to put on the whole armor of God so that we will stand firm as we engage the daily battles we have with our flesh. Without this armor of righteousness, we are helpless. But with it, we are soldiers of the living God and more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. Let us sing to Christ, our great high priest, who has offered his blood as a sacrifice for our sins.
truths we have just sung. Lord, indeed, Christ has humbled himself. Lord, has taken on the form of man, become like one of us. Lord, that he might do what we could not do. Lord, indeed, he has borne our sins upon the cross, and his sacrifice has been accepted by you. Lord, we have been granted his righteousness. He is risen from the grave. Lord, death could not hold him. Lord, and we are alive in him. Lord, the debt has been paid once for all. There is nothing that can nor need be added to it. Lord, but for us to simply believe in what Christ has done, Lord, and to walk by faith, to please you, to obey you, Lord, to live out our lives as Christ here on earth to a world that is in need to be saved as we have been saved. Lord, we thank you for Christ, our high priest. We thank you that even now, he is before your throne, pleading, interceding on our behalf. Lord, we praise you and no other. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning, Hickman Community Church, and welcome to uh, this online service, service today as we gather together to worship our Lord and our Savior. Uh, we have been asking the Lord that he would move the hearts of our leaders, the politicians, the president and the governor, and that he would bring this separation uh, to a quick end and that we would be able to regather again. And as of this week, in fact, just a couple of days ago, yesterday, President Trump announced the churches that, uh, that churches are an essential service, and he declared them to be able to meet again uh, this Sunday uh, without restraint. Uh, of course, we were not ready for that, as I'm sure many churches weren't, but we're looking forward to bringing you as a congregation a clear process where we can regather with, with safety and uh, that, Lord, that the Lord will enable us to be able to come together again and to worship him and we'll let you know about that uh, this coming week well take your bibles and uh, turn in them please to hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 to 10 where the subject of uh, where the subject is of jesus as our great and perfect high priest and this morning we're going to see that this ministry which has already begun to be explained will be explained further. Now, as we come to a text like this, you might be tempted to think, isn't there something that we should be studying or could study that's a whole lot more practical than the high priestly ministry of Jesus? I mean, maybe you could talk about 
marriage and how to strengthen our marriages. Or, or maybe you're thinking, why not do a, a message on overcoming sin or a message on parenting or a message on how to live the Christian life or how to share the gospel? I mean, you could think of a lot of things, I'm sure. Well, let me remind you that this message that we're about to look at in the ministry and the high priestly ministry of Jesus is incredibly practical. And I want to show that by firstly reminding you what the scripture says, that all scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, reproof, correction and training in righteousness so that the man of God might be adequate, equipped for every good work. So this message is practical in that it will equip you for every good work. Secondly, to understand who God is and how God functions as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is absolutely critical for our growth and our ability to reflect a right image of God. We are called and chosen and set apart to to sit on display the glory of God. And so to study the nature, character, purpose, and plans of God are absolutely critical, are they not? So with that thought, those two thoughts before us, what we saw last week as we began the study on this priestly ministry of Jesus, we saw that it opens up a doorway here again for man to approach God. Without the high priestly ministry of Jesus, there could be no way which you and I could approach God in boldness and confidence at the throne of his grace. Rather, we would be those who would be living daily under a sense of his judgment. This is not the case. And I reminded you that this confident approach, expecting God's favor, was a contrast to the Old Testament where at Mount Sinai, the Israelites were warned not to come near to the mountain where God had descended unless they perish. Now, our sin has created a separation, has it not, between us and God, and therefore we need Christ to make it possible for us to experience reconciliation and fellowship with our Creator. This is all wrapped up in the high priestly ministry of Jesus. The death of Jesus Christ on our behalf as a sacrifice on our behalf is one of the most practical doctrines in all of Scripture. Because as we consider Christ offering himself in our place, we are humbled. And we need humility. But also, as we consider Jesus' ascension and exaltation to the right hand of God and his high priestly ministry in operation even right now, today, on our behalf, as he intercedes for us, as he ministers on our behalf daily, as we consider that ministry, we're also humbled. Because we realize that we need God's grace today just as much as we needed it the day that he redeemed us and saved us. The day that we were converted and changed and given a new heart and a new life. Well, we need that grace today In the same way. I mean, how can we be proud of ourselves when we know that our sinfulness brought about such a horrifying result as the death, the crucifixion of the beloved Son of God? Now, also, we know from Scripture that at the base of every relational conflict and every sin is our fleshly pride. And so it's good to be humbled. It's good to walk in a way that shows humility in a way where we cover ourselves with a mantle of humbleness. And so a better knowledge of God's holiness and, uh, and his provision for sin and the means of grace through this high priestly ministry of Christ are all ways that we can learn to walk more in humility and less in pride. And my prayer this 
uh, today and this message is that we may see even more clearly the glorious, gracious provision of God in the exceeding greatness of Christ's ministry as our great high priest. So take your Bibles and read with me, read along with me here in Hebrews 5 verses 1 through 10. Beginning at verse 1, the author of Hebrews, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writes, For every high priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God, in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and misguided, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to offer sacrifices for sins, as for the people, so also for himself. And no one takes the honor to himself, but receives it when he's called by God, even as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And although uh, having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would open our eyes and our understanding to see and behold the beauty and the wonder of this one who you have called a high priest forever, a priest forever on our behalf. God, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his mercy and his love and his grace towards us day in and day out. And Father, as we come to this text, Lord, would you guide us and teach us and instruct us and make us more a people who understand what it means to reflect the glory of the God in whose image we have been created. We ask this for your glory and for the building up of your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there are the two commands back in Hebrews 4, verses 14 through 16, the command to hold fast our confession of Jesus and the second command to draw near to the throne of grace find their foundation in the fact that we have a great, a superior high priest in Jesus Christ. This claim by the author would have been ground-shaking to anyone who was of Israelite descent reading this letter. Uh, the author is literally saying that God has brought forth the fulfillment of the entire high priestly system, the Old Testament high priestly system, and by implication, the entire structure of worship as given by Mo Moses. There is a complete and utter fulfillment here in Jesus Christ. Now, remember that this letter was probably written a couple of years before the destruction of Jerusalem and the total decimation of the temple. So temple worship would have been going on. There would have still been a high priest in Jerusalem operating, going through the motions, as it were. And so this letter cuts across the very cultural reality of this nation, the nation of Israel. And, of course, their religious and ceremonial processes. In our text for this message, the author takes the liberty to further explain and expound and develop the superiority of Jesus over all other priests for his readers. Firstly, in verses 1 through 4, the author outlines the qualifications required to be a high priest in the Old Testament system. And then secondly, in verses 5 through 10, he applies these qualifications to Jesus Christ, showing conclusively that Jesus, the Son of God, is our perfect high priest. So this message 
will consist of three parts. Firstly, the qualifications of Old Testament high priestly ministry explained. Secondly, the qualifications of high priestly ministry fulfilled in Jesus. And then thirdly, I want to add a section for our application, and I've titled that section, The Implications of the High Priestly Ministry to Our Lives. So let's look at the first section, the qualifications of Old Testament high priestly ministry explained, verses 1 through 4. And what we see here are three essential qualifications of a high priest that are listed out in these first four verses. First, what was this high priest focused on? And this is the first qualification. He was focused on the spiritual. Look at verse 1. It says that he was a high priest taken from among, from among men, appointed on behalf of men in things pertaining to God. Not things of the world, but things of a spiritual nature, things pertaining to God's. And in particular, the high priest's ministry was a ministry, a spiritual ministry, uh, that operated in the sphere of, uh, between man and uh, between God. He did not deal with interhuman squabbles over man-made laws. Rather, his meditation and mediation was that he was and would be a representative and a representation of, uh, of man before a holy God. Now, more specifically, his ministry existed to deal with man's sinfulness. If men are not sinners separated from a holy God, then there is really no need for a priest or even a high priest. It says he was appointed then on behalf of men and things pertaining to God in order to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. The Israelite sin made a separation between them and God, as every man's sin does. No Jew was free to go into the Holy of Holies to meet directly with God. If he did, he would be killed instantly. There was only one who could enter that place and only one day per year. And this was really the reason and the significance for the high priest's entrance into the Holy of Holies on that day of atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement, as you remember, was proclaimed uh, as a fast for the nation, and it reminded the Israelites of the Lord's holiness, of God's holiness and their sinfulness. After the high priest had bathed and washed himself and put on his linen cloth clothes rather than his radiant office vestments, he chose for himself and his house a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. This was for himself. From the congregation, he would then take two goats as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. He would offer them up. And then he would take uh, two goats uh, and place these goats uh, at, the, um, at the entrance of the tent, one at the entrance of the tent of the meeting, where he would cast a lot, assigning one goat for Yahweh. That goat would then be taken inside, and the other, the scapegoat, that would remain outside. Now, first, he would kill the goat offered to the Lord, take its blood into the Holy of Holies, and there he would literally sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat above which dwelt the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. And in this way, he would symbolically provide a covering for the sins of the people for another year. For without the shedding of blood, the Bible says, there is no forgiveness, no covering of sin. Secondly, after he would leave the Holy of Holies, uh, he would go out and take the second goat, the scapegoat, and he would present it alive before the Lord, where he would place both his hands on the head of that goat and confess the sins of the people of the nation, thus symbolically laying all of the transgressions and all of the iniquities of the people on this second goat. Then he would take the goat and set it free. He would release it into the wilderness. And the goat would be driven away from the people. This was, of course, to picture the nation's sins being carried away. So we have these two sides of atonement. We have this idea of covering, and we have this idea of removal or taking sins away. 
Both are, of course, true for the believer today, for the Christian today, because that's what Jesus Christ did. He both bore our sin, he carried it, shed his own blood to cover it, and carried it away. The Bible says God will remember our sins no more. Now, he would go on, of course, uh, and throughout the year, the high priest would be a part of the ongoing uh, offerings, as it says in our text, to offer up gifts and sacrifices for sins to God. And all of these offerings were for one specific purpose. And ultimately, it was to provide a way for the sins of God's people to be atoned for so that they could come and have fellowship with God. So since sin was the biggest problem facing man, the focus of the high priest then was for man's spiritual needs, not for the nation's social or political issues or even personal issues for that matter. As I said at the start, for squabbles, interrelational issues. No, the high priest existed for this one purpose, and that is to provide a covering for the sins of the people. And so it's a spiritual purpose. But secondly, we see the second qualification of an Old Testament high priest was not only that he existed for spiritual purposes, but he was identified as human. Verses 2 to 3 says, For every high priest taken from among men. Stop there. The author's point is that all Jewish high priests were taken from among men, even as Aaron was, in order to be, in order to be one who could identify with the people. Really, the idea is that, that, that by coming out of humanity or coming from humanity, he was then able to effectively understand the problems of those who he represented before God. If he had not been taken from among, among men, he would not be able to sympathize with those he was acting on behalf of. The high priest needed to share in humanness to understand mankind and to understand his susceptibility and his weaknesses and his temptations. The high priest was not some kind of robot. He was not some kind of other creature. He was not an angel. He was, he was human. Aaron and those who were his successors were Israelites who grew up like every other man and were exposed to all the same conditions, temptations, pressures, and trials of life that everybody else in the nation experienced. They didn't just emotionally connect with people's struggles, but they shared people's struggles. And that's absolutely critical. And the author points out, as we read through these verses, verses 2 through 3, three things that would be evident in a high priest's ministry. Firstly, he would have the ability to deal gently with people. This is the defining the character of a high priest's ministry. This phrase, deal gently, denotes the idea of being in the middle. That's not, not in the middle between man and God. That's not the idea here, but between two opposing attitudes. On the one hand, the attitude of indifference, and on the other hand, an extreme attitude of sappy sentimentalism. Think with me about this for a little bit. This high priest could not be indifferent over the sin of the people. Uh, either, uh, neither could he be filled with, with indignation or rage and irritation or exasperated or apathetic or unconcerned, not caring about the problems of, of people. No, this man, because he was human, understood their problems. If he didn't, he would end up standing aloof from the people and not really caring for them, not really able to understand them. Neither could he be so relational, so understanding, so filled with sympathy that he didn't take their sin seriously. In other words, he was not allowed to ignore or condone sin. Extreme sympathy could cause a high priest to be overwhelmed by the people's sins and to become so identified with them that he would become literally a victim of the misery of others. So much so that he would become engulfed with grief and filled with fear and end up not helping anybody. 
And so a person who's either too sympathetic or apathetic can't help other people. You have to be able to enter into and identify with what that individual is experiencing. And thus he had to be human. What was needed was a high priest's character, and the high priest's character was, was somewhere in the middle between indifference and extreme a- empathy. He was to be a man who could deal gently with people. That's the idea of this phrase. Standing in the middle between those extremes. Moderating his feelings about their struggles, and yet remaining in a place where he could help them and minister to them on their behalf. Secondly, second description of this high priestly ministry was that this high priest would be gentle with the ignorant and misguided. And this explains really the object of his ministry. The idea here is of those who go astray through ignorance. Even as Christians, we cannot say that we are without sin. We often fall into the the category of sins of ignorance and find ourselves out on a limb. Why? Because we carry with us our flesh, this fleshly corruption that we we are to die to every day, but it, 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 it has its way of raising its ugly head, doesn't it? Our flesh will always be a hindrance in our walk with God and our pursuit of holiness. God's people continually commit sins of commission and omission and offerings Uh, And so so offerings were prescribed in the law to atone for the sins of the ignorance. Now listen carefully to this. When, When you examine the Old Testament law, you discover that there was no provision made for deliberate, willful, defiant law breaking. Such sin, according to Numbers 15, was worthy of expulsion or death. In the Old Testament, there was a distinction between the sins of the ignorant, sins of ignorance, which correspond to our fallenness, for which atonement can be sought, and a distinction between those sins and sins of willful defiance. And you can read about that in Numbers 15, 27 through 31, uh, where there was no sacrifice available for that kind of sin. This person doesn't care about God, this willful, defiant person. They don't care about God. They don't care about others. They don't care about their sin. They are living in sin purposefully, day by day, choosing sin and the pathway and the fruits and the, and the expressions of sin over and against God. Well, the sinning mentioned here is the sin of ignorance in Hebrews 5. It's due to our fallenness. And these are the ones who want to come back to God. They, they, they want to get right with God. They want to be cleansed of their sin. They want their sin forgiven. They, they, they know they've sinned and, they, and there is a, resp- a repentant response here. This should be the attitude of every Christian. Not sinlessness. Not, not, not perfection in that sense but a heart and a desire that when we do sin, to want to draw near to God. How can you do that? Well, you do that through the high priestly ministry of Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. He's seated at the right hand of God. And the Bible says He daily intercedes on our behalf. So we need to come and confess our sin to Him who died for our sin. And He who died for our sin will cover our sin and cleanse us, the Bible says, from all unrighteousness. And the relationship that's strained through our sin is able then to be fully restored. This brings me to the third <clears throat> description of a high priestly ministry, and that is that he himself also is beset with weakness. And this explains the motivation of his ministry. What allowed him to, be, to even have this kind of ministry to others was that he was prone to the same weaknesses as all other Israelites. Literally, this, this phrase, beset with weakness, means 
to be wrapped around with weakness. He knew the weakness of fallen humanness and depravity so well in his own life that when someone came to him in that state of weakness and and out of a desire to put right or to deal with their depravity, he could understand them. He had sufficient experience of human weakness to have a balance between, as I said before, being overly sympathetic or, on the other hand, being overly severe. You can see how important his role was, a priestly role. And we see that even reflected, do we not, in the New Testament in the, in the role of pastors and elders and shepherds. We're not to be too severe and we're not to be too apathetic. We've got to find that middle ground to help people grow in godliness and holiness. So because the Old Testament priest was a fallen man like everyone else he ministered to, he is, it says in our text, obligated to offer sacrifices for sins as for the people, so also for himself. This is all part of the Day of Atonement ritual. As I said earlier, before he offered up a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, he first had to offer up a sacrifice for his own sin. He had to go through this this ritual of cleansing of his own life and covering of his own sin before acting on behalf of anyone else. Leviticus 16 tells us he offered up a bullock for his own sin and the sins of his own household. And this would have reminded this high priest, would it not, of his own wickedness and it would have prompted him to put on a heart of gentleness and compassion and humility when dealing with others' sins. By the way, this is, again, if if we apply it to our own lives, this is how we are to be, isn't it? with others who sin around us. We're to be gentle, instructing those who sin that they might repent and, and walk in godliness. When you put all of this together, you can clearly see that the high priest was a human being like everyone else, one who was human, one who was identified with human beings because he came from humanity. But there's... There's a third important requirement to being a high priest. Not only did he have a spiritual work, not only was he qualified in that he could, he he was human, but thirdly, verse 4 tells us he was authorized by God. You see, men needed priests. They needed a mediator between them and this holy, holy, holy God, this unapproachable God, this God who is a consuming fire. And so the appointment of men to this priestly function was, a, uh, was of critical importance. And since God is the one who hates the sin and the sinner and needs his wrath to be satisfied against sinners, this man needs to be one whom God has chosen, whom God has appointed. And indeed, that's what our text says. For the love of God to be displayed, there had to be a sacrifice. And ultimately, that sacrifice as we know, was made by Jesus Christ. For the blood of bulls and goats could not cleanse anyone from sin. They just simply pointed to the ultimate one who would sacrifice his own life on our behalf. Well, this takes us back to verse 1 where we see the high priest was appointed on behalf of men. And that word appointed is in the passive voice, which means he didn't make his own appointment. He was appointed by God. And that's true of, of Aaron and that's true of every other high priest that flowed, that flowed out from Aaron during the Old Testament period. Now, of course, we know in the New Testament there were self-appointed priests. But we also go back into the Old Testament, we discover that there were people who violated this principle and appointed themselves as well to be priests. Numbers 16, we find Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and they claimed that any Israelite could be a priest. Well, God didn't agree with them, and he opened up the earth and swallowed them alive. And then there was King Saul in 1 Samuel 13, who who got anxious and antsy because Samuel hadn't turned up. And so King Saul decided that he was going to offer up a priestly sacrifice 
But the problem was that Paul was not a Levite. He was a Benjamite. And so he too received a punishment for, 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 the, for acting as a priest when he had no right and had no appointment to that task. In fact, he was told that he would no longer have an enduring kingdom. And of course, history proved that to be true. And then there's a, another man in 2 Chronicles 26 named King Uzziah who was warned not to enter the temple and yet he in, intruded into the, into the temple in a way that he was not supposed to. And then God smote this man uh, as a consequence with leprosy and as such he was forced to live a life separate from the people. His entire life in isolation. These are all really sober warnings to point out that not just anyone can be a high priest and approach God. And as we come to verse 5, our author takes the three qualifications of spiritual work, human identification and authorization by God, and he now applies them in reverse order to Jesus Christ in order that the people who are reading this might understand that Jesus had every right to be called a great high priest. So let's consider those qualifications in reverse order in verses 5 through 10. The author not only shows that Jesus fulfills these qualifications, but that he superseded them as being a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Not according to Aaron, not according to the, the, the Levitical priesthood, but according to the priesthood of Melchizedek. Now he's going to explain that in chapter 7. So I'm going to leave it till then. But for now, just know this is a different priestly order. But the author gives the same three qualifications, as I said, in reverse order. The first is, Jesus was appointed by God, verses 5 through 6. So also Christ did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you, just as he said also in another passage, you are, my, you are a priest according, forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now the author here is quoting Psalm 2 verse 7 to show that even though Christ is the Son of God in a unique relationship with the Father, he did not glorify himself by taking the office of high priest. Rather, the author is saying God designated him as such and not just a priest in the limited human sense of Aaron's priesthood, but as I've said, a, a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And that comes from Psalm 110 verse 4. We see here also that the offices of Jesus' kingship and priesthood are united. And the point I think it's is pretty clear that both roles are appointed by God himself. And thus, he is both son and high priest, superseding all priests before. But Jesus was appointed by God. Secondly, Jesus was identified, identified with humanity. In the days of his flesh, verse 7, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. He was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. Jesus Christ was able to identify with the weaknesses of humanity because he took on human flesh. But unlike these priests, he had the Old Testament priests. Jesus had no sin of his own. In the days of his flesh, that little phrase refers to Jesus' earthly life. But verse 7 especially points to Jesus' agony in the Garden of Gethsemane as he wrestles with the imminent prospect of taking our sins upon himself and enduring the wrath of God against our sin. Jesus' intense struggle in the Garden is not just over the, the, the thought of the physical agony that he would go through, the agony of crucifixion. Rather, he's struggling with the thought of taking on our sin in such a way that the Father can no longer look on him and there is a separation between him and the Father. Now, don't ask me to explain that. I, don't, I can't explain that. 
How can God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, how can there ever be a separation between three who are one in essence? I don't fully get that. But what I do know is it happened, and in, in, a, in his humanness, Jesus cried out at the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And thus he identified with us. How many times have you thought that God's forsaken you? Jesus was praying that he would be brought out of death or saved from death. And the idea is to be brought out of death into resurrection glory, being restored to his father once again. This shows that in his humanity, he was totally dependent on the father to deliver him. He knew he, in his humanity, couldn't deliver himself. In the truest sense. Now, Jesus could say, uh, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. But his authority ultimately in this world as a human being was found in the Father's will, in the Father's purpose and plan for him, in the Father's appointment as a son and ultimately as a high priest. When it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered, it does not mean that he was formally disobedient. The first phrase is better translated, son though he was, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. It points to his position as God's unique son. And Jesus learned obedience then in the sense that he experienced what obedience means through what he suffered in his humanity. He was always obedient to the Father's will, and that cost him dearly. But the proof of obedience is revealed in situations where obedience is not pleasant. And the greatest unpleasantness of Christ's humanity was the cross. So Jesus then was fully human and so he was able to sympathize fully with our weaknesses because uh, of his humanity. Well, that brings us to the third qualification. Not only was he appointed by God, not only was he human, but Jesus' ministry focus was spiritual needs. Verses 9 through 10. And having been made perfect, verse 9, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now this phrase, having been made perfect, does not imply that Jesus was previously imperfect. Rather, the idea is that his experience of, of obediently suffering unto death qualified him as the savior of mankind. Eternal salvation is contrasted with the temporary nature of the Old Testament sacrifices, which could never make one perfect or could never ultimately cleanse us of sin. And the word translated the source really means the cause. The cause of our eternal salvation is Jesus Christ. It's not that God foresaw that we would believe in Jesus and so we become the cause. No, Jesus himself is the cause. The cause of our salvation is that a triune God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And he chose us in him to obedience. By the way, that's what faith is. Faith is not only believing, but it's acting on the word of God. The man who has faith intellectually understands, but willfully obeys. These are critical elements of faith. So Jesus became the, the cause then of salvation to all those who obey him. Now that's not teaching salvation by works. Rather, to have saving faith is to obey Jesus Christ. Those who have been commanded to repent and believe the gospel and they do that will then obey the Lord of the gospel. They will take up their cross. They will follow him. They will walk in his ways, not their ways. They have removed their, 
their own self off the throne of, of their mission control center. And they have come to the Lord Jesus Christ humbly and said, Lord, please lead me, guide me, direct me. Paul refers to the obedience of faith in Romans 1.5. This is what faith is. You cannot separate saving faith from obedient faith or unbelief from disobedience. Those things all packaged together. The man who is disobedient is unbelieving. We've already learned that in, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 4. But those who truly believe in Jesus as Savior live in obedience to Him as Lord. And those who claim to believe who live in disobedience to, to the things of Christ, they're not truly saved. That's what the Bible teaches. You can't be two things at once in that sense. You can't have a life characterized by disobedience and at the same time claim to be living by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's impossible. Well, finally, in verse 10, the author comes back to God's designating Jesus as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, which places him in a category by himself. This is a unique, uh, a separate, a, a unique category uh, for Christ. It's above the Levitical priesthood. And the need to be born of Levitical descent. And so we can see then that the argument this author is bringing here is, listen, this is who a high priest is. These are the qualifications. A high priest does a spiritual work. A high priest is one who can empathize and enter into the human condition because he comes from humanity. And a high priest is one who is appointed by God. And all three qualifications are found here, are exposed here to be true to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that Jesus meets all the necessary qualifications but he exceeds those qualifications and that he has that he is of eternal origin and we'll discover more about that through this order of Melchizedek, Melchizedek a priest without without father or mother it's an interesting passage we'll go back there later on to the Old Testament and look at that but really what he's saying here to his Jewish audience is listen to go back to the old system would be to return to a severely inferior system of worship and would be to abandon the high priest that you most desperately need for time and eternity. That's really what he's driving at. This is a great encouragement to these young believers in Christ who have accepted Jesus as their Messiah. This is a great encouragement to them to persevere, to endure even in the difficult times that they're facing. Well, let me bring this message to a point of application. And this is really the third point, the implications of high priestly ministry to our own lives. I've mentioned a couple as we've gone through, but there are no direct commands to believers in these first 10 verses for us to obey. We can only learn from this instruction, and we can learn a great number of things. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but I want to give you enough to see the connection, to help you see the connection between Jesus and his high priestly ministry and you as a Christian who has been called to a royal priesthood. Firstly, first thing I think we can, we can apply or learn from here is if our sin is so hideous that God required nothing less than death of his perfect sinless son as the only solution, then we would be foolish to think that any human solution will suffice. In, in other words, to think that we can do some sort of works that somehow are going to get us into the kingdom of heaven is to ignore what is blatantly obvious that there is only one way into heaven, and that's through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Why would God go to that extent to deliver us if you and I could save ourselves? We can't. And if God's wrath, secondly, if God's wrath against sin is so dreadful, then we need to flee to the cross, to the Lord Jesus Christ for refuge, and daily live with gratitude that Jesus bore our penalty on the cross. 
I want to speak to those who may be watching this message right now uh, who are not believers, who have not yet put your faith and trust in Christ. Listen, today is the day of salvation. The Bible says if you come in repentance and faith and trust the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will be saved. This is a great promise. And God is true to his promises. Will you come humbly? Will you come broken over your sin? Will you come in faith, trusting that Jesus Christ took that sin and and bore it in his own body on that tree, on that cross, and that he endured the wrath of God for your sin? See, that's the call here, isn't it? So practical. And then as believers, thirdly, we need to daily draw near to our high priest who can cover and cleanse us of our sins of omission and commission done in the ignorance of our flesh. In other words, if you're not, if you're a believer and you stumble because of your weakness, because of your flesh, then get up, approach the throne of God's grace, come to this high priest who has loved you enough to die for you and loves you enough to cover you. Come to him. Find cleansing. Find forgiveness. Find mercy. Find the ability and the strength to stand again in faith and walk today by faith. Fourthly, since the church is identified by the Apostle Peter as a royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2.9, we would do well to consider our mediatory role between the unbeliever and God. For we are appointed by God to a priestly ministry of prayer and intercession for both believer and unbeliever. We must put on a heart of humility like the priest and have sympathy for these people, identifying with their sin, praying with them, for them, and lifting them up before the throne of God's grace and pointing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the priests of old, our main focus must be the spiritual needs of mankind, not just the social and the physical needs. Let us never forget who we once were and what we have received by the grace of God. And let us never forget that that was the most important thing in our lives at that point at that time. And it's the most important thing for all eternity. Dear believer, there are people all around us who don't know the saving work of Jesus Christ and who don't know the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. And the only way they can know is if you introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all it takes. Just as you would introduce a stranger to your family, well, introduce them to Christ as well. And finally, let us point people to the one who has changed us and secured us with an eternal salvation so that they too can share in the blessings of the rest and the peace of sins forgiven and a sure hope of eternal life in heaven. May these applications, these implications and applications as they come to our lives, uh, may, may may, may we take them seriously. May we see this connection. And may it cause us to to rejoice all the more in the provision that God has made through Jesus Christ. And may it cause us, even this week, to consider those who are needy around us. And may it cause us to act in a priestly way, in intercession and prayer and proclamation of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Will you join me in a word of prayer as we close out this service together? Father, as we bow before you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that he qualified and superseded the qualification of a high priest ministry. And that just as the Old Testament people were able to draw near to you, God, through the the priestly ministry, the high priestly ministry of, of atonement, so too we are now able, as this author has explained, to draw near to the throne of your grace in confidence because we know, Lord God, that our sins have been covered and removed 
and that the Lord Jesus Christ has created in us a new heart and a new mind and and, and that the, the Spirit of God has come to dwell in us and that, Father, you now see us not as we once were, under judgment, under condemnation, without hope, without you, Lord, once separated from you. No, now we've been brought near by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that. And we worship you this day and in the days that lie ahead. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless. Have a wonderful week. And look forward to soon being able to gather together again.